everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the artist of the soon-to-be-released Parasocial over at Image Comics. It's Erica Henderson. Thanks for coming on, Erica. Hello. Uh, great to be back. Uh, very excited to be here twice in one year against your rules. You're a rule breaker. <laughs> How's the day going for you? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, It's uh, we're finally getting actual fall in Massachusetts, and it's it's lovely. I don't like being hot and sweaty. So what does actual fall mean for you? It just means I'm not sweaty anymore, like, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Is it like a temperature you're like, no longer sweaty time? It's been so humid that I actually just had to wait for the humidity to go down, because like, there was a week when it was in the 60s, but it was still really humid. So you're just sort of standing there being like, I don't know how to dress, because no matter what, I'm going to start sweating. <laughs> yeah. I know that New England is famous for having all the fall visitors. Like, my parents went there one year because they're like, we got to see the leaves change. And I'm like, you know Yeah, they're, they're called and- leafers. They're called leafers? Okay. Yeah. Do you get that where you're at? Uh, there's some. We kind of get a constant swarm of people just because uh, we live not too far from, like, Harvard. Okay. So there's, like, always tours no matter what. So at a certain point, it's hard to tell, like... Are you here with your kids because you want them to look at this school and also MIT and like Northeastern and Tufts and like the thousand other schools that are right here? Or are you here to take pictures or both? Right. I guess when you're in such a heavily visited area, it can be kind of difficult to tell why people are there. You just know that there's a lot of them. Yeah. And also like we're in the city and you generally want to be like out in the woods for believing. but. There's so much, you know, there's so much history here. <laughs> I just have to say the leafing really sounds like some sort of horror movie type thing. It's like the leafing. No, I, I don't think I would watch the leafing. That sounds scary. It's just the happening, but like brown. <laughs> <laughs> but brown. There you go. I do think it's interesting, though. We, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording. It is either. OK, so we talked about this before. It's either the week before release as we're talking or it's two weeks before. But it is an amount of time before release. And so yes. naturally, you're, you're kind of in the the interview pocket and everything like that. I'm always curious as to what the interview scene is like from like the other person's perspective. Is it challenging to keep coming up with new ways to say things? Or is it just, is it less about coming up with new ways to say things and more just about getting the word out there? It's, it's more the latter. I am generally not, like, if you're listening to three different podcasts that have the same guests that week because, you know, something just happened or uh, there's a book coming out. Like, you you know you're going to hear similar things. Right. So. You can't really avoid it. That's on you. <laughs> no. There's only so much you can do when you're getting asked similar questions. Especially with books, you don't want to give away parts of it. So you can't, like, explore other aspects because, like, well, you know, you want someone to read the book. You don't want to talk about too many other things. Right. So you, there's already, like, a narrow focus when you're talking about a book that's not even out yet. Yeah, and I I guess with like kind of serialized comics, it's like you can kind of speak abstractly about things in the future because they may or may not happen to some degree. You can just be like, this is a thing that's interesting to me. But with Parasocial or with Danger and Other Unknown Risk, when we talked about it earlier this year, if you start talking about the latter half of the book, all you're doing is spoiling your own book. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Which I don't think anybody's listening to podcasts for. Maybe they are. I don't know. I did read an article about how podcasts are the next haven for graphic novels. And I'm like, I don't know how... That doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what that means. They're graphic novels. Art is a part of it. Unless you're, I think at that point you would just be watching a movie then, because then there's the audio and the visual component, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about Parasocial. It's your (laughs) Image Comics graphic novel of Alex DeCampi that's hitting, I believe, the week this podcast arrives. Here's the solicit. In the middle of the pandemic, a fading genre TV actor fresh from his long-running series cancellation collides with an obsessive fan at a Texas convention. When she lures him to her home, uh, he'll have to put on the greatest performance of his life simply to survive until morning. Unless, of course, he's the real monster. I told you before, this book rules. It's engrossing (laughs) and upsetting, and it made me reevaluate the comic convention experience in a lot of interesting ways. Let's start with the (laughs) basics, though. You had worked with Alex on Dracula Motherfucker before. Yes. How did this book come together, and what made you want to collaborate with Alex again on something like this? Well, we had sort of talked abstractly about there being other books that wouldn't necessarily be part of a series, but would have kind of, they would have themes that were connected, but would not be related at all otherwise. And this was just sort of that, this was that next book. Like we were already talking about what the 
third one will be, which is again is totally different, but has sort of these connected themes. <laughs> There's the the loneliness, the desire, um, the the sort of the feminist aspects, but that are also dangerous, you know, with the the brides in Dracula Motherfucker. They're mm-hmm. obviously they're dealing with a like powerful man that is holding them back, but also they're not great either. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they're they're still Dracula brides. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So it's like a thematic series more than it's and like a traditional series where it's like the same characters appear. It's more about observing and and looking into the same themes and connecting those across multiple stories that the two of you do. Yeah, and I, I think at first because. I was still working on Danger at the time. She was actually going to give this one to someone else, and then they they couldn't do it for some reason, and the timing wound up working out. It was it was funny reading the script, knowing that there was someone else who was doing it, because there were a lot more explanations for things mm. that if it was for me, there wouldn't have been. There was a lot of like, Alex, I know what clamp is. I was also a girl in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be like things related to like the storytelling or something, but instead it was like specific references. Well, yeah, like the the other person who to do it uh, hadn't really done a lot of conventions. So there was like a lot of explaining what that was like, oh, which wow. I thought was very funny. Yeah, that is really funny. It's funny. Also, I had actually been thinking about it because so Danger and Other and Unknown Risk, if I remember cor- correctly, came out in April. Yes. And then this is coming out in October. There had to be some sort of overlap in, tw- in between the work. You had talked about this first while you're working on Danger. Well, not first, but you talked about the idea that you couldn't do it because you were working on Danger. And then when you finished Danger, it was still open, basically? Yeah, I mean, Danger took like... A while, right? Oh, my God. I mean, to come out, I mean, from when... Even after all of the editing and extra stuff was done. Because like I, I was done at a certain point, and then there were like months of little tiny changes and then just half a year before it was out mm-hmm. or more than half a year. So there was plenty of time to do another book, <laughs> but uh, in that time period, you know, like usually with direct market stuff, it's like three months, right? something like that. It was more for this just because we got it done at a certain point. I know what it is. We wanted to make sure the book market was ready for it as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it took... S- I've never done something with like a traditional book company like Penguin before. So the the time period was shocking. I mean, that is one of the funny things. We were talking about just like the release date thing beforehand. And a lot of people don't really know that book market books are often done like 12 months or more before their yeah. release. Because about 12 months is when like the marketing starts, where they start kind of, hey, you know, librarians, booksellers, this is coming. Here's our catalog for winter 2024 or something like that yeah you, you need to know that this is coming and with direct market stuff it's just like this is coming in a few months here it here is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so it is a much different thing because they have that whole like marketing department behind it where they're kind of giving a consistent not a consistent but they're giving it a push throughout that entire year window up until release and after release quite often and I don't know, I mean, Parasocial had to be done pretty early too, right? Because it's a, I imagine it's a graphic novel. It's like you wouldn't want to announce it and then be like, man, we didn't finish this. This is going to be tough. When did I finish Parasocial? You know what? I'll bet I can just look at my files and see when they were last updated. <laughs> well, I know Kyle Kyle Starks, when he was on the podcast last, said that he had read it. And I think it was back in like July, I want to say. Oh, uh-huh. was it done that, that early? Yeah, when he was last on, it was June. June. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, he said he had read it at that point. Maybe it was like a... That makes sense. June makes more sense to me than July. <laughs> okay, okay. But going back to the thematic tri- or the thematic series idea, and also just the central idea of parasocial, I mean, there's a lot of things that... Not that you've experienced, but you've experienced cons. What appealed to you about this idea? Was it more continuing the thematic series? Was it more the central idea of parasocial? Like, what was it that was a draw to you? Uh, I, I think it was more the general idea of it, like the, it's the themes, but also how differently the themes play out. Like with Dracula, we're running all over the place. Even when there is, aren't things happening, it's very action oriented in the sense that like, we're here, now we're here, now we're over there, now we're doing this, now we're talking to that guy, uh, now we're over running around this area. And 
there's not a lot of that in this book. It's there's really mainly like three locations. Two yeah, pretty much. And it was it was interesting to sort of just really focus in on these two characters. Uh, it's not something you do a lot in comics where you have an entire book that's just two people dealing with each other in one space. In a weird way, I could see it be a play. It's like kind of like yeah. a two-hander that you could see done in a theater where it's like the only set that changes is it goes from a comic convention to like the inside of someone's home. At some point, somebody would have to, well, I don't want to get into spoilers, but something would have to change. But that is really interesting. And it's also, it's not really something you see a lot in comics, but it works really well. I mean, like that's one of the things I think is interesting. It, it feels really intimate and it feels very... I don't want to say small. Small sounds insulting, but it's it feels very <laughs> it, it does it feels intimate in a way that makes the whole thing feel so personal. And I think that's part of the reason why it's so intense is because you're reading it and it's something these two people, but even before then, like you kind of get a sense about who Luke Indiana is before you go in there. Luke Indiana is the aforementioned uh, soon to be former star, but maybe not soon to be former star. And you get a sense for who he is. But like once you get in, in that room, it really escalates in a way because of that proximity between the two of them. Right. And I think part of what I enjoyed about it, too, and what makes it work really well as a comic specifically is because the perception changes so often. Like this book is a lot about perception, uh, how we view each other and ourselves. I got to play with how the art changed and how color changed around basically like who was in charge or who was looking, who was feeling something at the time. Getting to play with that was really fun. Like you just you get to push that boundary because comics are so abstract. If you do that in a film with real people, like it's very, it's noticeable in a way that's distracting, you know, like you're making a huge point if like colors change, but with comics, cause it's, it's, you can do it because it's, you, you know, you know, it's not real, you know, it's like lines on a page. Right. And so little things like that, they don't dominate. I totally get what you're saying. I mean, one of the things that really stands out in the beginning of the book is like the beginning of the book starts with some Instagram posts from the the main or from one of the main characters, Luke Indiana, which I want to say, this is how broken my brain is, Erica. When I was reading that on my iPad, I tried pushing the links <laughs> on Instagram to go to Will Moss for Reels page. I'm like, why isn't this? Oh, no. David, what are you doing? This is terrible. But anyway, so it starts with these Instagram links, and then it has this cameo where Luke Indiana is singing somebody's birthday, well, singing Lily's uh, happy birthday to her, and it's done in this very specific light. And then the next scene you see him, he's waiting outside the convention, and it's all very green, and he just looks miserable, and it's like a completely different version of him. And I do think that's one of the things that's interesting about this, and you write about this in the back, but... You can do things in comics that you can't really do in other in other mediums where you can change the perspective. You can make somebody be this idealistic kind of almost like manga fan art version of themselves in a moment. And it's not going to be jagged. It's just going to be like, this is really cool. And it works. Is that part of the reason why you love comics so much that it allows you that type of creative freedom and to like bring perspective into it in a way that feels integrated? Yeah, I mean, like, there's something to be said for the amount. I mean, it's difficult, but it's also satisfying the amount you can control each and every moment. Like you, you have to choose what moments people are seeing and what moments are being experienced. Like there's a lot of implication between panels, but like every panel, there, there are so many choices that you have to make about like, is this necessary? Is this something I want here? What am I saying? And with that, you can do a lot. Like you can imply a lot just by including a moment, a point in time, just by like not even doing anything special with it. Just the fact that you've chosen this point in time means something. And you don't have that with, let's say, like something moving like a play or a, or a movie because you have to show it. Like you can't just skip a few frames. It's it's just all happening in you know more or less real time until you cut. <laughs> I read in an interview with skybound that you said one thing you really like doing is you definitely will fight to add little moments and 
I mean, I think we've talked about that before. I think we talked about that with Mr. Toadsworth III and how you liked, you actually included the shot of him like flopping around on the ground after he'd been thrown. And it really added to the moment for me. And like, that's something you kind of always do. But it seems like those little moments are almost extra important parasocial when it's so small. Like you want to include whether, I mean, this isn't even a small moment, but there's like flashbacks in this book. And one thing I really like about the flashbacks is they always kind of have this like, I don't even know how to describe it, kind of like a white, heathering, kind of distressed look to it, where it's like you can tell that the past isn't like fully remembered in a in a pure way, or maybe that's just how I interpret it. Oh, no, that was on purpose. Yeah. No, no, no I, I know it's on oh, purpose, okay, yeah. but I wasn't sure if I was interpreting the meaning correctly. Yeah, I mean, it was because it's a, a memory, I wanted it to not be as clear. And that was and that was a uh, kind of an easy way to get those across because there are so many times we change perspective, not just in the very typical, like, oh, we're doing a flashback that I was like, okay, I just need like a shorthand for this because we're going to do it a few times. That's what I really like though, is, is like, not only are you having these little moments, but also it seems like they give you a chance to make very specific creative choices that reflect the difference in those little moments. So it's kind of like a a a double pronged like super important thing for you where you can distinguish them and make those moments pop quite a bit is is that something you're really going for there yeah and like even that uh like cameo scene you were talking about in the intro when we see luke with like a filter on talking into the camera before we cut to him in real life in like the grungy parking lot lighting I played around with how I colored him. Like the the lines are a little bit fuzzier because he's got a filter on. And also like just something, the tiny thing I wanted to add was he has a ring light that you can see reflected in his eyes. Mm -hmm. Just more little things to show like even this has a level of artifice, but you can see it because you can see that he has this, you can see in his eyes that he's doing extra things to make himself look better in this moment. That's one of the things I think is kind of funny about like the idea that we're kind of separating these different roles where it's like, you're the artist and Alex is the writer and never the twain shall meet. But what you're talking about is, it's just storytelling. Like you put a lot of depth into it too. Like, you, when you go into these moments, you're like, okay, it's a ring light, so I need to light him differently. I need to put the, that in there, and I need to make sure that these elements are in there. And you think about all these different scenes. I'm curious as to when you get into this, when you get into parasocial, like, what do you do before you ever start a project like this? How much have you figured out before you start drawing anything? Because if I imagine if you just went into starting drawing pages, obviously you're going to lay it out and stuff like that. But like, do you really try to think about how you're going to light different scenes and how you're going to like make this one work before you ever get into anything? I mean, a lot of stuff happens in the layout phase. My layouts are basically stick figures, but there's a lot in there where you know, that's where I'm sort of breaking up panels to, like we talked about before. Although I do less of it with Alex's stuff because like she comes from kind of this film background. And so there's a, she has a really good understanding of timing. So there's a lot less of doing that with an, an Alex DeCampi script. But uh, so I, in the layouts, I'll, you know what? I have a pile of layouts right here for another book I'm working on right now. I'm just going to look at the like many, many notes that I took on them. So yeah, I literally just opened to a page in the sketchbook that says, house is dark, basement is lit, but poorly. Do that thing where shadow goes red tinted. (laughs) (laughs) Just like little pointing at stick figures. And another thing that I started doing with Dracula, I think I talked about it on here when we talked about that book, was now that I'm doing stuff mostly digitally, I still lay out in a little sketchbook, but I'll pencil digitally and I'll put color in at that point because having the color and the lighting while I'm thinking about the drawing part of it really helps. Part of it is just that like at that stage while I'm doing the drawing, I have a clear image of the color in my head. So if I come back later, like I've done this step and then I've done this step and then this step. And like, I wait, if you leave the color until the very end, it just feels like an afterthought. I want it to be integrated and I won't necessarily drop color into every panel and it's messy color like i'm just like tossing colors down it sets the tone of a page for me 
and sometimes you know you don't need a lot of it's like oh we're in a daytime scene or someone's walking around in a mall like everything's pretty evenly lit as long as i know what the colors are i have an idea and maybe like if a new item comes in i'll like make it red or something just to know that there's this pop of color we want to follow around and then that'll maybe that'll inform how i color or draw the rest of the page because there's this brightly colored item and i don't want to have this super red thing dominating or i do maybe i do want it dominating and that's why i made it red yeah so th- those are the big considerations um and part of that just happens in the drawing like the i'll spend so long on layouts because where things are positioned and how they move across the page are important but now that i've started coloring in my roughs that's become a huge part of it as well but like there's there's a part that I think is easy to plan. And there's a part that you can't know until you see it, until it starts to happen in front of you. And so it's there's a little bit of both. There's a little bit where I've got to like, at least figure out all the placements more or less. And then there's this like secondary thing that'll come out afterwards. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Do you wish that buying and reading digital comics was even easier? Well, I have good news. Omnibus is here for you. Omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues, volumes, and omnibuses all day and date. They're paper a book, just like your LCS, but digital, so you're already used to the experience. Their focus is on building an excellent customer shopping and reading experience and using novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book. They feature top tier content and already have many of the top publishers and comics today on board. Want to find the right digital comic shop for you? Download Omnibus today on the Apple App Store to do just that. And now, back to the show. I do think it's interesting how when like a penciler, inker is doing another role on top of that, whether it's coloring or it's lettering or whatever. Like I had, I talked to Marcos Martin not that long ago, and he was talking about how in his, I think he said in his layouts, but it might have been pencils. I, I think it was layouts. So he was talking about how he always lays out the uh, speech balloons that he's going to oh, use. I got those too. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make sure that like he's not going to be covering up the writing or it's not going to be in the wrong place or something like that. Because once he gets to a point where he's drawing it and he's like, like, well, now I'm screwed. I like didn't think about this. It really helps going in knowing where the color is going to be or where the lettering is going to be. Did Alex uh, letter this again? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. You already knew where the balloons were. Or you placed those, and then Alex worked off that. I placed them in my layouts, but I generally trust Alex. After that, like there are times where I will turn in pages that are being lettered by someone else, and I'll include a layer on my files that has little balloons to work off of but like i didn't think i had to with alex like it was it was pretty clear either where there was space left for balloons or it was i figured that she knew what she was doing because i trust alex for that how different was the process of parasocial versus something like i mean danger and other unknown risk is a a wildly different book in the sense that you know it was very much co-written by you and and ryan but was it similar in the sense that you and Alex kind of would talk about the different roles and kind of like go over everything, you know, or not different roles, the different, the writing and the art, or is it really more about separation? You handled the visual, non-lettering visuals, Alex handled the the script. How did that work? Uh, for this, it was pretty separate. I mean, partly because the script was already done oh, yeah, when I point. saw it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the I'd say the harder thing about this book versus other ones was luke specifically interesting and it was that uh a tv handsome sci-fi channel original series star who's now maybe slightly too old to keep playing the like twink character that people you know put him in a lot of fanfic for we know what that guy looks like that's a specific type of guy that's like and trying to figure him out, like you can you can see him in your head, or at least like what he might be. But God, that was that was difficult. And then like someone who can switch from handsome to ugly depending on where he's at. That was also tricky. Like wh- where do you what do you do with someone who's like naturally handsome and charismatic moving back and forth between these emotions and someone who like we said 
if he's not lit correctly, if he's having a bad time and not worried about what his face is doing, can just look a little older and haggard, <laughs> despite being an attractive man. When you started talking about that, like everybody knows what this person looks like. I know this is an imperfect connection, but for some reason, my brain just went to, I was like, who's the guy from Vampire Diaries? And I looked up, <laughs> it's Ian Summerholder. I'm sorry, Ian Summerholder. Apparently, you were exactly who I imagined when I think about somebody would do that. I don't even know if he's on the con scene. Ian Summerholder, you might be missing out. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or maybe he's not. Maybe he doesn't want to do it. Maybe he doesn't want to do it. I don't blame him. I mean, have you ever done a celebrity photo? No. I was going to say, I did once. And it was only because I was at Emerald City Comic Con. I was about to meet with Heidi McDonald. And I had some time to kill. And I'd never been to the celebrity area. So I went to the celebrity area. And I love Carl Urban. I think Carl Urban kicks ass. And cool. I asked the person that was managing his line. I was like... How long do you think that would be? And she like looked at it and she like eyed it. Like, you know how like some people will hold money and they can know exactly how much money is in there? Like it's just mm -hmm. a big chunk. She looked at it and she was like, 15 minutes. And I was like, interesting. <laughs> and so I texted my wife. I was like, should I get a picture with Carl Urban? He's doing pictures of his thing. And she was like, yeah. And so then I went up and I went through the line. It was, and I'm not, I'm not even kidding, exactly 15 minutes. I get to the front. He's uh, he's like, oh, you know, we talked for a little bit. And he's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, let's do dread faces. He's like, oh, a couple tough looking guys. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and so I did a picture and I was like, it was very funny. But also I couldn't help but notice that like how weird it must be to take picture after picture with these strangers. But he, he made it work. It's definitely something that you have to, I think, have a mentality for. Maybe Ian doesn't have it. I don't know. Well, it's also... I mean, I think it helps when you're an actor, but I think there's a certain level too where anyone working a con, Alex and I have had to do this. Someone comes to a table and you're like, hey, how's it going? You know, you're just, you're now in friendly mode. You're now like, you're selling yourself. You're selling a version of yourself that is kind of tweaked to whoever comes up. Like if you come up sheepish, I'm sure he would have been a little more toned down, you know? Yeah, I guess that goes back to the perspective, right? Because it's like, if you run into Luke Indiana at his table, you're going to get one version. If you run into him in a garage, you're going to get another version. If you run into him on the side of the street, you're going to get a different version. It's all a matter of perspective and what the situation is. And that colors your art. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm in a new gym group. And there's someone in my group who definitely knows comics. He And I mentioned that I had, I was applying for a, a Radcliffe fellowship to do a short story collection, short, uh, graphic short story collection. And the next time our group met up, he was like, hey, here's some comics to look at for inspiration. I was like, thank you. And I was just like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a like, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's God. <laughs> Very nice guy. Good for him. Good for him. But I am curious as to like, so you had Dracula Motherfucker. Incredible looking book, but the way you colored it was the way you would color Dracula Motherfucker. And also the way we would draw it in times. Danger and Other Unknown Risks. That was a middle grade book. Definitely not going to be the same vibe. This has a much more naturalistic setting. There's no vampires. You're going to do it in a way different way. I'm curious as to, do you want to go into a project knowing you want to have a dramatically different look, whether it's how you handle color or other specific elements, or is it less about forcing them to distinguish from one another and more about what a project needs, even if there is a visual overlap? It's more what they need. All I think all of those choices come from what I got out of reading the scripts, or in the case of Danger, like coming up with it. Yeah, I mean, with Danger, part of it was even just, I remember at one point, one of Ryan's drafts for the second chapter he had described this very like kind of alien landscape it's like the grass is purple and this is this color and i was like no it's not that <laughs> and like from there <laughs> i was able to be like okay what am i doing with color because i need to think about this now <laughs> <laughs> did you actually tell ryan no stop that uh, i was like we're not doing this <laughs> i don't remember exactly what happened but or i might have just rewritten it we told you that one where it's like we're just going back and forth rewriting each other's stuff. So I, I might not even have said it. I might have just been like, cut. <laughs> <laughs> it was the X's. You were just doing it down uh, pages over and over. Yeah, I just delete. How much did you and Alex talk about visuals ahead of time? We didn't really. Yeah? I, th I think the interesting thing with Alex and I is that we just... Do your thing? Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of talking about it because I think we 
we know what to expect from the other person. Sure. And even if you don't know what to expect, you know what to expect. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, you don't know what's going to come out, but you know you trust it. <laughs> It is interesting because, I mean, it's very clear that Alex thinks very visually because, like, the the book opens with, like, Instagram posts and then it has a cameo, but there's also text around it. And then there's, like, these moments where, like, fan fiction is integrated into the page. And those are, I mean, they're text, but they're also visuals. And it's interesting to see, like, I mean, if those, if those are in the script, I mean, like, that's very clearly, it's like Alex is thinking visually in a way that you can work off of and enhance and drive to another level and then build off of from there, which I think is really cool. Yeah, and some of that will come from the way I decided to treat something like uh, when we're leaving the convention and we're in the parking lot again, there's a a long text thread that's going down. And I think originally that was just a panel on its own. Like there was just, it was happening between other spaces. But because I had done this like fade in to the parking lot structure, she was like, oh, okay, we're just going to plop it right here. It is really interesting. God, the flashbacks are so great. But I, did you draw, Did I mean, I know in the back you talk about how you have different line weights for different scenes and everything like that. Did you deliberately try to draw those slightly differently besides the fade? Because it's interesting. There's some looks at Luke Indiana and his wife in particular where it almost feels like a different artist drawing it to some degree. I think with the flashbacks, they're generally a little more open and sad. So yeah, they they got a little more naturalistic it's sort of like if you're watching a mystery movie or show and you see a flashback it's like okay that had to happen because now we're seeing it right i felt like the flashbacks had to be more honest Mm -hmm. because even though you can like lie about the past if we're seeing it there has to be a level of honesty at least for what that very moment is like the moment can change we add extra context to it or whatever but like i feel like flashbacks are often a little more honest. I mean, it's interesting to think about, like, there's a flashback where he's talking to his uh, his wife and he just looks terribly flustered. And then, like, shortly thereafter, he goes into his panel and there's all these, like, zoom-ins of, like, his mouth where he's just being, like, a creepy weirdo who's, like, leaning into, like, the vibe that everybody wants from these panels where he's kind of, like, flirtatious. Yeah, like, you, you want him to be sexy. Uh, you know, there are so many times in the script where Alex was like, we need to zoom in on his, like, sexy wet mouth. <laughs> <laughs> was that the exact description? That's not the exact description, but, like, it's some version of those words. You know, if you look in the thesaurus, th- 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 thesaurus you'll find whatever <laughs> word it is. But, it, yeah, it was some variation on sexy and wet. <laughs> it is interesting to think about because, like, you know, you talked about the difficulty with Luke. Luke is an interesting character to bring to life, if only because you're kind of, like, doing his entire IMDb page. He's, like, all these different characters. He's not just, right. you know, cool guy up on a panel stage. He's not Rogue Nebula. Rogue Nebula is the show that he was on. He's not just Rogue Nebula Luke. He's not just Down on His Luck Luke. He's not just I'm in Danger Luke. All these different things. He's all of them. And, like, in different moments, he's different versions of those versions. And it's interesting because yes. he plays like 30 different characters in the in the book. And it makes him, I don't know, a very fascinating character and probably a really interesting challenge in that regard because it's not like you just drew Luke and you're like, this is that guy. You're like, every scene, he was a different version of himself. Yeah, I mean, that, that was part of why it was so hard. I mean, on top of just trying to capture that exact type of guy, the fact that he changed so much, and it's not for a role, right? It's not just like, oh, here he's playing a pirate captain, so he has a little beard. Or <laughs> here, like, he's got a little makeup on. Like, no, he's not wearing any fucking makeup. He's the same guy, right? It's just the same guy feeling different things with different types of lighting on him. And that's what made it extra difficult. I mean, there's there's part of it that I think about where depending on how the uh, the rags feel about a certain actress, they'll post like a picture of her done up or they'll post a picture of her under a weird light, like in the middle of saying a word. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about that kind of stuff where like the same person will look completely different depending on even just the light they're standing under or if they're saying a word at a time or they're sneezing a- anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is really interesting to see all those different versions of it. What about Lily? Lily is interesting because Lily is like, you know, Lily's the fan. 
It's interesting to see like how the the often comp for this book has been misery, obviously, but it, it's a lot more than that in a lot of different ways, just because of like the inner, there's no Kathy Bates here. They're kind of both Kathy Bates no. and they're both James Caan. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, that makes for an interesting thing. What about Lily? Like, did you going in, did you know that you, you needed a specific type or was it more about kind of creating this approximation that didn't seem like anyone, but also seemed like everyone at the same time? Lily was a lot easier because Sam is a lot easier of a person to get around. But I think one of the things we wanted was that she would be a little heavy, but also cute. So we weren't going to do the thing where it's just like, oh, the obsessed fan is real fat. How gross. You know, like that's such a trope. We also didn't want someone who was idealized in any way. You know, like she should feel more like a normal person. Except for in the self-image. Yeah. 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 Uh, except for in the self-image. But like her her regular self uh, and even her, like she has her her convention outfit, which uh, is a style that I'm told is uh, called Madewell goth, where you're you're being goth, but with cheap stuff you can get from Madewell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but she's got her like little black tank top. She's got her onk necklace. Uh, and then later on, she has she puts on an outfit she says she wore to Dragon Con. So it's like. That that was the most fun I had with Lily was coming up with her Dragon Con outfit because it had to be like convention sexy. Like you're you're doing your goth thing, but it's gotta be like heightened at a certain level. But also she's not rich, so it had to be things that I felt were affordable. And for me, that was like she's in a kind of crinoline skirt, so it's very poofy, but also this type of this type of corset you can buy off the rack. There's this just coming from my own past and like other people I know who like do conventions or want to buy these kinds of clothes. They fit terribly. It is impossible to make these things look right because they're, they're not corsets are designed like traditionally to fit to a person. And if you don't do that, you use little bits of plastic. They like ripple in your body. And I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture that. Like, I want to wear this. I think it's cute, but it like, it's not flattering, but it can be because it's like, you feel confident in it, right? Like you don't give a shit if your body is making little ripples, if you feel good. And that was a really hard line to like, there were, there were so many thoughts about like women's fashion that went into this and like off the rack, uh, goth fashions (laughs) that I had to think about. So it was less about designing her and more designing how she wants to present herself because i think with luke his face is so important because the people we pick to go on tv and movies like they are sort of designed right like you have to you're picking a type of face but with regular people you don't get to pick their faces but after that point they get to pick what's on their body right and so it was so much of like okay what does she want to wear what can she afford uh, so these are all like real pieces that I thought fit her budget. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> there's this one moment, I'm not going to call this a spoiler because it's so small, but there's this one moment where she's in that outfit and she's looking kind of distraught. And then like she switches, like a flip switches and she's in character and she looks up and it's this kind of like sexy look where she's saying, I wore this to Dragon Con and she's like looking down on Luke. And it's interesting to see how kind of like this... I don't know. Like my read on it was almost like, this is my chance. It's time to wow him. And like, so she has this look to her and it's interesting to see how those moments change things. Is that just a general cosplay thing or is that supposed to be kind of her rogue nebula look? No, it's just like a a sexy outfit. Okay. Okay. (laughs) You know, it's, it's just made of like different cute goth store items. Did you like when it came to the costumes, there's not a lot of Rogue Nebula in here, but there are shots of the varying characters (laughs) in there. Did you do any uh, special viewings for uh, Rogue Nebula design purposes? What do you mean by special viewings? I mean, like, did you watch any kind of of those TV shows where we're talking about where it's like maybe like a a CW show from like 2007 that was like sci-fi and was kind of, I I don't know. It sounds like I'm talking about a very specific show, but I don't really have one. Like something that fit in this vein of character that might be a good guide for you figuring out what the look of these characters would be. I didn't look at anything specific because like it is meant to be its own thing, but it's also very specifically, it's a very specific vibe, right? Like you had a thing that you were thinking about. I had a thing that I was thinking about. Um, 
Like you went CW, I went sci-fi original series. There we go. There we go. <laughs> but uh, for the prince character, we only see like once or twice in promotional materials because this is so fandom related. And s- clearly this is a series where everyone's shipping the two main male characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went, is basically, I was going boy Utena for the prince or whatever. I forget. If he's not, he's not a prince. He's something else, but whatever. You know what I mean? And for Luke's character, <laughs> uh, he's, he wanted to go sci-fi. And I actually wound up, I did a variation of an outfit from a place that's advertised to me a lot where their whole thing is doing kind of a post-apocalyptic clothes. <laughs> and it's a place I keep looking at because uh, there, there is a photo of Grimes in one of their like $2,000 jumpsuits walking around performatively pretending to read Marx. Oh my and God. it's like so funny to me that I was like, no, I need to do this place because like all of their clothes are sort of like fashion Fremen. <laughs> <laughs> fashion Fremen? Oh my God. It, Nothing says aspirational like a still suit. Yeah, no, but that's like their whole vibe. And I know. It, yeah. was, it was too funny to me and it fit with like a little bit of tweaking with that whole like Farscape kind of vibe. Sure. That I was thinking about. So. God, it's so funny. Do you, so when you come across things like that, do you have like a special like reference type folder? Is it just something you put in your brain? You're like, someday I have to bring up this Grimes outfit because it's too amazing. I I used to do the folder thing. And then I realized that I just never looked at those folders because these things are so specific, right? Like when I, when I thought about that, it came to mind because I made that association. I'm not going to look like this folder and be like, oh, what does the fashion area have in this folder? And it's like a lot of random stuff, a lot of stuff that like I thought looked interesting for a moment and then put into a folder and they have nothing to do with anything. Right. So I I tried that. And now I just, I'll make project specific folders now. So if I'm working on something and something comes to mind, I'll put it in the parasocial folder and it may or may not come up, but I, I, can no longer do the here are pictures of trees folder. <laughs> did you have a folder in Parasocial that was just like con photos with celebrities? Because you did that. There was like a montage of scenes where people are taking photos together. And I was like, I feel like I've seen these before. Not with me and Carl Urban. I don't think I saved any of those just because that's just one page of kind of uh, sort of pose reference. But and also I, I know cons. I've been to so many. I didn't really need to save any of those pictures. I think it was more, I think actually for Parasocial, the thing that I saved the most pictures of was uh, trailer homes. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. I guess there are two in there probably, right? Yeah, there's two. Yeah, there's two. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, you want to distinguish those for sure. I do think the convention part is interesting because I wasn't joking. Like, I look at conventions in a weird way because I pretty much have only ever gone to them not in the same way as you, but kind of as work, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. I go there for a press capacity, and I'm only going to do stuff like that. And so I kind of don't really look at them. It's not that I don't have fun, but it's like I'm going there for a reason. And looking at it like this, I guess I never really thought about I'm not so ignorant to not to not know that that's how some people are. Then like sometimes like let's say I wore the same shirt twice at two different cons in a different photo, you would notice, like if somebody would notice. But that was like the type of thinking that I'd never really thought of before. And it was a really fascinating insight into it. It was like, I don't want to say it was like sci-fi, but it was definitely like looking into a different world (laughs) for me, a world that I'd been to and just never really considered in that way. Yeah, I think a lot of the con stuff were just things that Alex had overheard at real cons. Oh. Like, almost none of it was made up. Right. Yeah. Even down to the girl saying that she had to open a new credit card because the credit card is maxed out because she wanted a photo with Luke. Like that was uh, verbatim something she had overheard at one point and just like drilled into her brain. Oh my God. That's so wild. It's so wild. I learned a lot there. (laughs) And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. October is here and things are cooling off for fall, but not over on Zoop where this month is going to be hot. 
There are too many campaigns to name, but there will be launches from the legendary Howard Shaken, Second Coming's Richard Pace, the team behind the comic Canto, Green Lantern's V. Ken Marion, and the creator of the TV show The Goldbergs, Adam F. Goldberg. And that's just scratching the surface for October with so much more on the way. Head over to zoop.gg to support the live campaigns and sign for the ones coming soon. It takes less than 30 seconds to create an account, and the e-commerce style checkout is easy and intuitive. Add multiple rewards and add-ons into your cart, provide some info during checkout, and you're done. No confusing additional steps in finalizing your pledge, and no post-campaign surveys. And of course, every creator appreciates your support. For creators looking to crowdfund your project, Zoop is currently open for submissions. Email them at hello at wearezoop.com to start a campaign. And now, back to the show. Okay, so just a few more questions about Parasocial. I did want to ask, you know, we talked about color. We've talked about a color a few times on the podcast, but I think it's interesting this might be just me isn't reading too much into it, but it feels like color is just becoming increasingly important to your work, where when you wrote, you write up in the back about your approach to this book and how the perspective changed how you would draw the book and everything like that. But a lot of it wasn't about just the line weight. It was about color and it was about how you use color to kind of mood scenes and do everything like that. Is color becoming increasingly important to your work or is it just like now that you have it under your con- your control, it's just something, another layer you have to think about more? Both, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the former is true that it's becoming more important, but I think it's becoming more important because I'm thinking about it. I mean, like the the next book I'm working on has a lot of Chinese stuff (laughs) and so there's just like reds an important color and it and i just need to think about like okay what scenes do i even use this color in so now i'm like at this point where i'm thinking about okay there's certain colors that i just literally can't use unless certain things are happening Mm -hmm. and thinking about it in that kind of way so i but i'm currently writing a story where i don't think any of that matters because it's not you know there isn't a color deeply tied to the subject matter in the way that we're talking about Chinese celebrations, like red's just the color. Yeah. Is that something you're writing for yourself to draw? The Chinese one? No. No, that's that's with Zi Chun, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I did mention that. Okay. No, you did mention it on here, but you mentioned another interview and I was going to bring it up anyways. But the, the other one I am writing to draw, that one's for DC. Okay. It's interesting. I was actually going to bring that up because... From the outside, you've had this like crazy year. You had like a two graphic novel year. You had two books come out in a six month span. Two graphic novels, uh, not of. I mean, Danger and Other Unknown Risk is long. Like that's a lot of drawings. That's a lot of writing. Pages. Yeah, yeah, and then this is like a hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty ish. And so, like that's obviously you didn't put that up all this year. That wasn't something you're doing. You were done with that a while ago. But yeah. You're you're doing that the project with Z. You're writing something for your, yourself to draw. Also, I'm curious as to like how you figure out what's next because like when I talk to artists in particular, one of the things that they always fear is like gaps where they don't have work because it's just like you start to develop that fear of like what's when's when is the next project coming? Do I need to say yes yes to the next thing that comes? How much of the job is like sequencing things so you're always set? Or are you more about like? finishing a project and then figuring it out from there? Uh, I mean, if there's a way for me to get something set up, that would be great. I mean, currently, I I might have too much on my plate. <laughs> uh, so I'm not thinking about too hard. Also, like I said, I applied for that Radcliffe Fellowship. So like, I don't, I won't even know if that's a thing in my future until the end of March. Thanks, Radcliffe. <laughs> so that's going to be difficult to set things up. I, I don't know. It's It's always chaos. I am at a point where I think I don't need to say yes to everything. But like this writing thing, I felt like I had to take it. It's like, oh, someone's asking me to write something completely on my own that I'll then get to draw in color. And that is, uh, it's horrifying, but also it's a great opportunity to get this done, to have this thing that's like only got my name on it, which is exciting. I was thinking, I mean, because you co-wrote danger and other unknown risks. And obviously that's a different animal than just writing yourself. But at the same time, it definitely feels like writing and drawing your own stuff is kind of like the the next natural step. Not that you can't collaborate with others. I'm, you know, there's another book to do with Alex. You got the book with Z. Who knows, maybe Ryan will be out there again someday. But at the same time, it's it feels like kind of the natural progression. Not that you have to do it. You can you can co-write or you can just draw or do whatever. But was that something you kind of started wanting to do, especially after you co-wrote Danger and Other Unknown Risks? Yeah, I mean, I've 
I've wanted to do it for a while. I think doing danger really helped me figure out my way around a lot of blocks. Um, part of what worked really well for danger is that like the thing that I think I'm good at is if someone says like, okay, I have this, where, where do I, what do I do with it? Where do I go with it? I'm like, oh, okay, great. I, I know how to do that. It's the coming up with the first part. And sometimes the end part, but I'm good with middles. I'm really good with middles, I think. <laughs> but I can sort of like, if I have something to jump off of, I think it's easier for me to like, okay, and then this comes next and this comes next. I've now written and drawn like three little Harley Quinn backup stories. And so I've I've been figuring out like how to do these things that I didn't know how to get around. Like that sort of that blank page thing of like, where do I start? Mm-hmm. I've, I've sort of figured out I can start anywhere. I've just realized that. It's the takeoffs and landings that you kind of struggled with? Yeah. I mean, like with landings too, it's more even just like, okay, I know where I want to be. How do I make it exciting? Mm. You know, because you generally have an idea of kind of where you want to wind up. Right. You know, like with, with Danger, a lot of it was was about where you wind up. And we spent so long trying to figure out, okay, how do we get there in a way that's compelling and not just like a big weird speech yeah i mean i guess that makes sense because it's like sometimes you read books graphic novels books whatever i'm movies sometimes you watch movies where it's just like it just ends and you're just like well that is over now yeah <laughs> you don't have that energy kind of coming off of it where, where it really hits like i do want to say a parasocial ends very very well so good job by you and alex on that i'm not going to talk about it obviously because that would be a very terrible uh thing to talk about <laughs> but it does make sense because the first thing is like where you start is kind of going to define the rest of the, the whatever story you're telling. But on top of that, it's also going to be the hook. It's like if somebody doesn't read that and immediately want to go on, they might not go on. And if right. th they finish it and they're just like, well, that's just over, I guess. They may not want to read your future stuff because they're just like, well, that's the person who just wrote that story that just ended. And I imagine that there is like a for any storyteller, there's probably a lot more weight on you in the beginning and the ending than there is in the middle because the middle is just all all fun and games yeah because like the i mean the premise really you know that that determines where things can go and then you can grab one of those possibilities and keep extrapolating from there i think what i've realized is useful to me is you just keep extrapolating until you find out why you're doing this you know, like, if you start with a premise, it, it could just be like a just any random stupid thing. But once you start going down the path, it's like, okay, now I know what this story is about. And once you know what it's about, you have a better idea of how to get to the end. And I think that was the thing that I've kind of learned is that you can't sit down and be like, what, what am I going to write about? It's just you got to just do it. <laughs> and then it will tell you. I don't want to make any assumptions, but I also don't feel like I should ask. The, the DC thing, it sounds to me, well, at the very least, you were doing those Harley Quinn stories. And mm -hmm. you were doing something for DC, which I would typically believe to be a single issue thing. Lately, you've been primarily working in graphic novels. I am interested in whether or not one side appeals to you more. Like, do you find, like, your, your lean has really been in graphic novels of late. Do you find that you prefer the length and kind of the runway you get to craft a graphic novel more than you prefer the the more limited space and probably limited timeline for single issues? Or do you see different appeals on each side? I just like having finished stories. Yeah. I mean, even when we were doing Squirrel Girl, Ryan and I were kind of planning that each trade would be an arc. You know, like there was still kind of a finished story with every book. You know, it was a, a little four issue thing and then one additional story. That was every single one. We always had that. So it it's not so much length as much as I just need this. I need an ending because without an ending, you don't, I don't think you have a completed story. Like you, it, there's no point if you don't know how it ends. So it's not satisfying to you as a storyteller. I guess what it sounds like from the outside is like, you wouldn't be satisfied by the experience of an artist if you just did one issue in an arc that you didn't get to finish. You like to be able to tell a complete story, whether it's in graphic novels or in single issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if I had a, an issue of an arc, I would still try to find some way to like 
put in a little mini story. <laughs> you know, like th- this is what happened on this day. The end. I mean, it's it's partly why as a lot of these big franchises have gone on, they've become less interesting to me because I need each segment to be a story by itself. You're allowed to say like this is one half of two, fine, but two has to like give me some kind of conclusion to this story and you can do another story that's fine but don't be giving me like 20 loose ends and being like we'll talk about it later like (laughs) no what the hell was that it is very unsatisfying it's interesting like talking about all this the the last question for you uh, i want to kind of tie everything together because it's interesting like since squirrel girl you did assassination over at skybound and then that was a way different thing compared to squirrel girl there's a lot more gunfighting than in Squirrel Girl, shockingly. And then you yeah. kind of went on to this, uh, kind of like the graphic novel side where you've kind of explored this different side where it's a bunch of like complete stories and, uh, you know, operating in different spaces. You had Middle Grade, you had, you know, Parasocial and Dracula Motherfucker, which have more of like a, a horror intense direction to them. You're kind of coming back into single issues. You're writing a little bit more. It seems like you're trying a lot of different things. And I don't know if that's because of experimentation or if that's because of opportunity, but do you find that, especially since Squirrel Girl, that, I don't know, I, I guess the question is, is, like, what's the biggest thing you think you've learned about what you want for yourself as a storyteller over the past few years since you left Squirrel Girl? I mean, I I think the biggest thing is probably that I, that I want to try. I, mean, I, I think this is all leading to wanting to try to tell more stories which is part of the like experimentation which i I think is less about experimenting and more just wanting to do everything sure you know it's that like there are all these things that i enjoy or want to say and i want to be able to put it all out there it's also coming to realize that i get bored (laughs) (laughs) doing the same thing too much you mean yeah, I mean, like, because I started doing a lot of, like, fabric art, I follow now more people who do fabric art. And I have a real appreciation for people who do a lot of, like, gallery installations, stuff like that, where they'll make 500 variations on a theme and put them in a room. And that's very exciting. Like, there's one woman I follow who has made, like, all of these 3D fabric and beaded human hearts. Oh, wow. And it's just filled the gallery with them. And it's like, it's cool. After I make one, I'd be like, okay, what's next? Like, I I can't do another one. I just, I don't want to do it. You'd have to like really be paying me. <laughs> and and at that point, it's like, it's a job and not something that I want to do. I think that's one of the big things I learned is that like, I, I just always want to be doing something else. And not in the sense that I'm trying to get away from something. It's just that like, okay, I've done that. Uh, why would I do it again? It's funny because I don't remember who said it. Somebody said this to me recently. Like one of the things that drives them is just like not being bored, fighting boredom basically with creatively. (laughs) And if you listen to that, like if if you're not really like thinking about it in a nuanced fashion, like like if you post that on Twitter or something like that, somebody would probably yell at you for you uh, for saying that. But they didn't mean it in a way that like, oh, like writing X or Y is boring. What they mean is, is like, they want to consistently be challenging themselves. They want to consistently be pushing themselves in a different direction that they haven't been in because it's like once you've drawn, I don't even remember how many issues, let's 40 issue. No, I'm going to say, yeah, 40 issues of squirrel girl. So you you draw 40 issues of squirrel girl. You're like, I got to get something different because I just lived and breathed squirrel girl and her vibe for a long time. So three years. Yeah, for exactly. So then you work with Ryan on danger. It's like, it's got to be something slightly different because if you just did the same thing again, you'd probably be bored with it. And it seems like, is, do you think it's the challenge or do you think it's, you want to keep challenging yourself or do you think it's more just like, I don't want to do the same thing twice? Well, I think those are kind of the same thing, right? Cause like once I've done it, now I know how to do it. And so it's, it's not something you have to think about anymore. Like I, part of, uh, I think my favorite part of the process is actually like the layouts because that's where I have to dissect what's in the text and make it work visually and whether or not I keep it as is or cut it up. I just need to figure out what is in the text and how to make it flow across a page. And that's something that I think is consistently interesting. 
But let's say you've done one thing. I have to say like one issue of Squirrel Girl when I'm in the drawing phase, it's going to wind up being much like a previous one. Right. And like, even if in the layouts, I wind up having to do a lot of little changes, like it's, it's changes in a way that I'm now used to because now I've done like 30 stories with Ryan. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny that this actually kind of underlines why something like your collaboration with Alex is really appealing, because it's just a thematic trilogy or a thematic series yeah. seems like something that's always going to be way different. If it was just like, this is a continuation of Dracula motherfucker, that might not be as fun because you're probably going to continue the visuals because it's expected because it's book two of the Dracula motherfucker trilogy. But because you did parasocial instead, you get to do something completely different and you get to find completely different answers. And it has yeah. like different nuances to it, like where you got to work in the Instagram stuff or you get to work in. Here's a, this is a question within a question. There right. is this moment <laughs> where Lily shares her name because Luke can't remember it. And there's like literally Lily is in her mouth and it's like to represent her yelling. Is that you? Do you do the Lily? Or is that that was Alex? Alex. Okay, because like SF or like sound effects and like text on the page sometimes can feel. I don't want to say feel the same, but they come from the same place. So I'm like, I don't know where that line lands. It depends. Uh, so a lot of times, even after Alex has uh, lettered something, I'll go in and be like, Oh, I want to draw over that sound effect because it looks too rigid. I'm going to do my own. Or there are certain ones that I had put into my own already. Like uh, when the car crash happens, there's a giant honk. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was uh, that I put it on my own beforehand. So it's like, I this honk needs to be a part of the page. Like it's a piece of the art. That like that stuff goes back and forth. What about something? There was like at one point where Luke says, what the fuck? And it's like integrated onto the page. That seems probably more like an Alex thing. But it is interesting because... I don't know. Like the, we've talked about this before. Like the nice thing about you doing your sound effects is it feels integrated with your line and it feels like much more connected because of that. I don't know. It, 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 I've, I found that part to be interesting because it, it did seem like the line was kind of blurred between what you would do and what Alex would do in a way that works. Well, yeah, that was Alex because, and she actually talked about it recently. So I remember it was originally just a big word balloon, mm. but because I had left that space there, oh. she decided to use it for that and i think i had partly left the space uh let me look at that page again so i can give you a better answer i like how you did the red behind luke on the the second one to really pop the uh upsetness of it that's one of my (laughs) go-tos just putting just a, a red background just it's a good way to emphasize the angry oh i'm looking at a different fuck that is filling up (laughs) (laughs) do that one more than once Pull that trick a couple of times. It's page 48. Okay. Yeah. Actually, that was on purpose. Like you left that space on purpose? Yeah. I think I had drawn a version in and then she put in her own version. Mm. That one was on purpose. So going back to my my original question that I totally failed at asking, do you think that's part of the reason why you like the, the kind of thematic trilogy is it's just kind of always keeping you on your toes and keeping you interested in that specific way you're looking for? Yes, but also... Because, like I was saying before, these two books are so different in how they play out. It's just the the emotions that are on screen are so different. Uh, like Dracula, it's so much about bombast <laughs> as we go from thing to thing. Like everything is sort of visually based on either giallo films or black exploitation or like just these very. 70s cinematic influences that are very large on the screen and this one while it deals with a lot of similar emotions like you were saying it's so small uh everything is so it's all about the micro and that was what was really exciting so it's like they're so different like dracula i drew that book so fast really it was so easy that book was so easy to draw because it was just like, everything was just bam, 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 bam. Like, you know, we're going to run on this page. There's going to be like a crazy scream on that page. We're going to fill it up with like these little designs. And it was just, it was so easy to think about. Mm-hmm. It was like, everything was just uh, beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And then it was, you know, uh, 
an Italian horror film. And it was like, great, I know what all this looks like. And it was so slow, seemingly, and parasocial, because everything was just agonizing. Why? Well, because like everything was like, it was very specific, like all those little turns, Mm -hmm. all the little ways that a face changed. Like even if I had the poses right, just getting the face right, like having the face change a little bit and have it still looks like them, but their their face has totally shifted, even though the we're looking at them from the same angle. And it was all these little nuances that made this book so much harder to draw. Well, and it's like we talked about it earlier. There's all the different versions of Luke. It's like you got to like which Luke is going to show up on the page now. And like, how is he going to be represented? Is it going to be Lily's yeah. Luke? Is it going to be Lily's not happy Luke? Is what which which version is it going to be? And so, it's not like you can just draw the same character over and over. You have to draw the the right variation of said character. Yeah, like I I knew which one it was. It was just I feel like whenever I'm doing this, I kind of have to embody it a little bit mm. and getting into who someone is when they're changing from moment to moment is so hard. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't embody it too much because that would, Luke goes some, to, some dark places. It's just when you're working on it, you know, just in the moment. <laughs> well, I'm excited for everyone to get a chance to read it whenever it happens to come out. It, it should be the fourth. It should be the it fourth. Be okay. the fourth. <laughs> Erica, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Parasocial, your career, and everything else. I re- really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it's, it's always great coming back. I'll, I'll be back for the next one, whichever <laughs> that is. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with artist Erica Henderson. You can find her on Blue Sky at, at ericafails.bluesky.social and on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Patreon at, at ericafails, as well as her work in the soon-to-be-released Parasocial. Big thanks to Deanna Chapman for editing this podcast. If it sounds better than usual, it's because of her. Love Off Panel, want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating or review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash offpanel, and when you back it on there you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more want even more subscribe to my subscription comic site sketched at sketch.com for long form articles interviews and the rest of the site's content you can find off panel and sketched on social media by following on twitter and instagram at, at sketch comic or following me at at slice right gold big thanks to all my existing patrons including jared schwab scott dunn chip mosher alan ellsworth seth pomeroy james McEwen, kenny myers andrew lehman christina merkler mike cancel scott place darcy van polgies travis schmeiser tom evans natalie mockery reed beeman kelly sudaconic max wood jeremy lambert brian hole mateo chicotti chris Ray, near levy dennis hoffman jason hussock karen gillen jonathan kent uratam henry johnson jingo boren james tynan the fourth Chris Langford, Jason Wood, Tom Peachy, Ben Damstead, Rom V, Nick Walker, Patrick Coyle, Isaac Oren, Scott Carpenter, Rent Narb Studios Comics, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Van Event, Brian, Submit Industries, Jack Mulqueen, Kyle, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwoods, Canadian by Proxy, Bradley Raider, Carl Troy, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shelby, Dan Garino, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, Nick Bennett, Birdcage Comics Cafe, Susanna Pola, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Stefan Hole, Phil Myra, Chris Pachala, Torn Grun. Beck, Fuzz Bubbles, Christopher Todd, Transmitted Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Kill Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Julia Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwan, Vita Ayala, Akil, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Nick Polito, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogert, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Zarelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Colin McMahon, Scott McCovern, Nathan Fairburn, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Wolfpack for letting me use their song, Outro, as the show's opening theme, and to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote and performed off panels, outro, and ad music just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify, because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode. 